welcome to the last in the series of lectures from Tribal Art London 2021. I'd just like to thank everyone that spoke and everyone that helped facilitate these lectures. Our final lecture will be given by Ferdinand de Jong and it will be on the Lantern Festivals in St. Louis, Senegal. This is based on de Jong's book, Decolonizing Heritage, A Time to Repair in Senegal, which can be pre-ordered if you click the link below. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture and I look forward to seeing you all at TAL 2022. Hello everyone, um, I'm Ferdinand de Jong and I'm delighted um, to speak to you today. Um, let me start by uh, thanking Victoria Rogers for inviting me to give this talk, um, which I'm delighted to give. I'm going to talk to you about lanterns in Saint Louis in Senegal. Um, it is part of uh, my forthcoming book with Cambridge University Press called um, Decolonizing Heritage, Time to Repair in Senegal. And I thought I'd mention this so that when it comes out next year, you will all order a copy, of course. Um, with apologies for for this advertisement. I also need to apologize that I am not actually uh, visible on the screen. The reason for this is that I will um, illustrate this lecture with photography by Judith Quax, um, a Dutch photographer, and I didn't think it appropriate to interrupt her photography with my talking head. Um, so that's why um, I won't appear in this in this lecture. In the lecture, I will examine how the historical heritage of the inhabitants of the West African coast is, material, is materialized in the fabric of lanterns and their performance at an annual festival. The Senegalese city of Saint Louis celebrates its Lantern Festival, or Fanal, as it's usually called, on an annual basis. During several days in the Christmas holiday, cultural performances of all kinds are staged at the central square of this, of this city. The climax of these celebrations consists of a procession of lanterns that culminates at the central square where the lanterns are presented to their patrons and the public seated at the square. There, patrons and public admire the lanterns that usually represent colonial buildings of Senegal. Praise singers praise the patrons, whose honour is thus aggrandized in public. Not only is their honour celebrated, the public selves are put on display in the public square of this formerly colonial city. Historically, the lanterns were first made for the signades, the mixed race women traders of the French trade posts on the Senegalese coast. Materializing their mixed French and African ancestry, these lanterns served to fashion cells that were recognized by the French. However, as I will try to demonstrate, the, lan the lanterns will subs were subsequently appropriated by the African citizenry, thus hybridizing their historical subjectivity in a post-colonial context. What is interesting about these lanterns and the festivals they are made for is that it constitutes a colonial heritage. The festival remembers colonialism and is a conduit for colonial heritage. But it does not remember colonialism as an oppressive force. It remembers it for the possibilities of making bourgeois lifestyles and civilized selves. There is another argument I wish to pursue. For the patrons, these lanterns represent themselves 
even though they are not the makers of these lanterns. The lanterns are made by craftsmen. Hence, the making of a sense of bourgeois identity depends on the service of craftsmen. Through these lanterns, patrons thus become inextricably intertwined and dependent on their craftsmen for their own making. And here I would like to quote an anthropologist of material culture, Tilly, who says, quote, through things we can understand ourselves and others, not because they are externalizations of ourselves and others, but because these things are the very medium through which we make and know ourselves. Unquote. And so this is the uh, anthropological wisdom, if you like, that I would like to elaborate on in this in this lecture. Um, and I will uh, do so by um, showing you a series of um, of pictures um, in order to uh, illustrate the arguments uh, the arguments I will be making. Um, because I attended one of these Fanal festivals myself in uh, 2008. And, and the pictures therefore date to that to that year. Um, the Fanal is a festival with a long history, um, and the revival of the Fanal is part of a current burgeoning interest in Senegal's heritage of métissage, and in particular of its signals, a brand of métis women, known for their wealth and extravagance, um, who dominated the social and economic life in the European trade posts of the 18th century. And I'm using here the word métis and métissage, which are French words that denote uh, both racial and cultural mixing. As a as a result of the presence of European traders, a class of Métis emerged both in Guadé and Saint-Louis. In the 18th century, these Métis women acquired fabulous wealth through their temporary liaisons revert, referred to as uh, mariage à la mode du pays, or uh, weddings in, in the mode of the country, with French company officials. So as their title already conveys, Signares, which is derived from the Portuguese Senhora, acquired a high social status in, in the strictly hierarchical social order um, that these trade posts constituted. Although some of these signades were of slave origin, their status required that they were always accompanied by domestic servants, enslaved Africans. The politics of distinction revolved around property and the ownership of one's own and other person's bodies. Um, and indeed, the historical emergence of the signatis as a class in um, these um, trade posts was part of the making of a transatlantic slave trade economy. The history of the signatis is part of the colonial heritage of, of Senegal and um, is very much celebrated in certain in certain places such as Gore and, and Saint Louis, um, and so many of the tourist uh, facilities in these uh, in these places um, speak to this Signare heritage. For instance, um, the jewelry shop you saw in the previous slide and of which you see uh, the shop window here 
Um, it's called La Signare, the, the Signare. Um, because the Signares were very well known for their material culture and for their uh, love of jewelry in particular. Um, so, so what is the origin of these um, of these uh, lantern festivals? It turns out lantern fe festivals are being held um, in port cities around the Atlantic. Uh, which is, of course, why it's been suggested that they are part of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, but where exactly they originated is unclear. So some people think that in Africa they had their origin in Freetown. Uh, others suggest Banjul in the Gambia. Um, others think that, in fact, the origin of these festivals is in the Caribbean. And apparently, um, lantern festivals are also held in uh, various European countries. Um, it is unclear where the, the lantern festivals uh, originated, but um, they clearly ex exist around the Black Atlantic. Um, they are not necessarily exclusively um, staged by Christians, because Muslims are also known to have participated in them. Um, and in fact, um, the participation is not limited to any particular class either, because um, it is most likely that um, everywhere slaves were asked by their owners to produce these lanterns uh, around Christmas by way of uh, some form of um, entertainment and leisure activity. Um, but of course, in all of these places around the Atlantic, the making of lanterns would have had uh, a particular significance, a particular meaning in each of these uh, towns. Today, the Fanal in saint -Louis is organized by a production company called Jagore Productions, that is presided by uh, Marie-Madeleine Jallo, who you see a picture of here. A great deal of work in producing a successful fanal consists of fundraising. One of the company's assistants spends a lot of time calling bureaucrats and, and visiting ministries in the hope of receiving some substantial funding for the fanal. Although the production company targets private companies as well, most of its funding is actually obtained with ministries and regional and municipal bodies of administration. The local tourist board also provides substantial funding and the most important hotels of the city used to contribute but have stopped doing so because it did not substantially increase the flow of tourists. Another substantial part of the funding is obtained by the patrons, in whose honour the, the, the lanterns or fano are, are made. Months before the actual performance, the production company approaches the craftsmen for the execution of the lanterns and the songs to be sung in honour of the patrons. In 2008, Three carpenters were selected to fabricate a lantern. Each of these carpenters heads a workshop in which he acts as master to a number of younger apprentices. For the frame of the lantern, they use timber of Senegalese origin. All lanterns are meant to represent a particular building, and in general, the craftsmen attempt to produce a faithful reproduction at least as far as the shape of the building is concerned. In the workshops, photographs of the building that serves as the source of inspiration are tagged to the wall to remind the craftsmen of the original. Some of the lanterns do not depart from rectangular shapes, but others have very complicated shapes and are assembled of various parts. As you can see, 
this funnel um, is meant to resemble the staircase that I showed you in the previous slide. While a week or so is spent on the construction of the frame, another week is spent on covering the skeleton with a mixture of paper sheets bought for that purpose in Dakar. In order to obtain the proper decorative pattern on the surface of the fanal, the lantern, apprentices spend much time punching the paper sheets with hammer and chisel. The paper sheets are then attached to the wooden frame with glue made of a mixture of millet and water. The lantern is finished off with decorations made of colored crap paper. Finally, the fanal is mounted on a wheeled frame. This frame also supports the generator that produces the electricity for the bulbs that will lighten up the lantern from within. During the last few days prior to the festival, time pressure mounts and some workshops, workshops actually work at night in order to finish their job in time. The production company also selects groups of women in various neighborhoods of Saint Louis to sing songs in honor of the patrons when the lanterns are presented to them. To compose the song, the company obtains a CV of the patron and consults the praise singers um, on the genealogy of his or her family. Together, the genealogy of the patron and his CV are used by the women to compose a song that they rehearse until all members of the choir know it by heart. For several hours a day, during several days a week, the women gather at one of their homes and rehearse the songs. Each of the women's groups prepares a song for the patron that they have been allocated. Indeed, the production company allocates the carpenters' workshops and the women's groups to the patrons. The relationship between the craftsmen, the women and their patrons are not based on a long-standing pattern of patronage, but are established for the occasion, which is made possible by the work of the production company. While this part of the organization is not determined by established form of patronage, um, although it definitely remembers patronage as a form, other aspects of the festival are steeped in traditional concepts of, of crafts production. Although the majority of people involved in the Fanal were craftsmen, for the 2008 edition, the production company had sought and obtained the help of some professional artists too. The producer Jean-Pierre Leur was invited to, vi to devise a choreography for the uh, Grand Fanal, or the evening at which the, the lanterns are brought out. As the former director of the Opera de Sahel, the uh, first African opera ever made, Leurs is one of the most sought after cultural producers in Senegal. And so he developed a son et lumière of various uh, tableaux historiques in which the lanterns were to make their appearance. Um, and to uh, put this in plain English, uh, the director Leurs conceived the historical pageants in which, in which the lanterns uh, are to appear. So the finale fundamentally consists of pageants, and each historical scene was to recount a particular history to be exemplified by a particular fanal, uh, a lantern, which was to be presented to a particular patron. Hence, Leus was also responsible for the spatial 
and temporal organization of the performance. How the lanterns, the choirs, and the historical actors should move across the space of the city and in which order they should make their appearance at the square Fedel. Uh, so here is a picture of uh, Jean Pierdeurs explaining to me the choreography on this on this map of Saint Louis, and and, and, and here um, I'm making an appearance uh, with one hand. At the uh, square Federbe of Saint Louis, which is the heart of the former colonial city, sits the governor's palace established under Governor Federbe, often referred to as the founder of, of Senegal, or as the French general who subjected the territory currently known as Senegal. In 2008, for the first time since the Fanal's revitalization, the governor of Saint Louis had allowed the production company to use several rooms in the governor's palace as dressing rooms. Much of the preparation of the, for the festival went on in this colonial building, which provided an appropriate setting to the historical pageants of the Fanal. And in fact, you see a painting or a drawing of Fenerbahce of here attached to a wall of the governor's palace. In this building, the models were dressed by fashion designer Umu Si, internationally renowned, renowned for her designs inspired by African textile traditions. Here is a picture of uh, Omo Si, um, who wasn't very happy with it, I must admit. Um, but she too offered her services to the organizers of the festival. Omo Si brought many of the coffers that you saw in the previous slide, containing historical dresses for the historical scenes to be enacted during the finale. She also led a fashion show uh, of clothes designed by herself and by some young and upcoming Saint Louis designers. The fashion show was held on a red tapestry laid out in front of the governor's palace, turning the Federer Square into a catwalk um, for the duration of the, um, of the fashion show. The finale consisted of a spectacle of sound and light, during which the lanterns were presented to the patrons. Invariably, the patrons of the lanterns are politicians or administrators of municipal, regional or national stature, which in the Senegalese political system inherited from France, tend to be the same persons. Most of the patrons are men, but in the past decade, several women sponsored a lantern, and in 2008, two out of the three patrons were women. Patrons should be wealthy enough to, pat to patronize a lantern, and rare are the writers, artists, or musicians that have been invited to act as patrons. Although Marie-Madeleine Jalot has tried to include them whenever possible. In the 2008 edition of the Fanal, fashion designer Umu Si was one of the patrons. So she had a double act as organizer and patron at the same time. The spectacle um, of the Fanal consisted of three historical scenes in which the lanterns were presented to, the, to their patrons. The models selected to act the historical roles were recruited amongst young women aspiring to a professional career in fashion. They were told that their performance could possibly lead to an invitation to perform at a show in Dakar. 
It was not easy to find sufficient volunteers for the historical uh, personages of Sinidis. So, um, as the public exhibition of the female body is today considered highly objectionable in, in Saint Louis. Since a formal casting on the Square Fedel failed to recruit sufficient personnel for the performance, some of the models had to be literally picked up from the street. A number of girls could be persuaded by the argument that the historical costumes um, for the finale would not endanger their reputation of chastity. An attempt was made to select girls of fair skin color in keeping with the historical imagination of mixed race signales. And, and the previous slides and this one show you how the girls were trained um, to, uh, to comport themselves during, during the um, uh, I think um, you know they were instructed how to how to um, how to walk, how to comport themselves, and the most important instruction seemed to be about remember no chewing gum on stage. Unquote. If there were enough uh, young, beautiful women whose collaboration could be sought for the impersonation of Signades, the number of whites available for the impersonation of historical Frenchmen was obviously limited in Saint Louis. Since access to the backst backstage of the organization was critical to my research, I volunteered to become Baron Roger, one of the governors of colonial Senegal. I should confess that I hardly knew anything about this historical persona, but I was soon reassured when I noticed that no one else seemed to know much about him. I should admit that Baron Roger was not my favorite role, um, although it does grant it certain privileges as um, backstage access to the preparations of the, of the final. And you can see me here ogling two beautifully dressed uh, Sinidis in the Governor's Palace. Initially, I volunteered for the prestigious role of Governor Fedab. This governor had conquered most of Senegal and is for that reason considered the founder of modern Senegal. I was rejected for this role for a number of reasons. One of them that Fedab was not bold. In addition, I was considered um, insufficiently mature to impersonate Fedab. Surprisingly, an American student about 20 years younger than I am was given the role instead. This American student had very little sense of Senegalese history. He had no clue as to who Fedab was and kept on joking he was the goal. So while we were all prepared uh, in our, for our roles, it was interesting that only white people seemed to be given roles of historical significance. The Senegalese volunteers were turned into either anonymous soldiers or nameless signades. Not that they seem to uh, much concerned with their minor roles. All the soldiers jested that they were fed up. Um, and in the end, perhaps the hierarchy in the um, impersonation of historical roles did not matter too much because in the end, we were all made to wait a very long time um, for the patrons to arrive at the uh, scene and for the performance to start. And here you can see us uh, waiting in the back uh, for the patrons to arrive. 
while the actors and actresses got dressed and um, in, in the governor's palace, elsewhere in Saint Louis, um, the lanterns were brought out of the workshops to be admired by the public. And here is one of the lanterns uh, being brought out before um, the light is lit within it. Um, the opportunity of bringing out the, the lanterns was also one uh, that the carpenters used to have themselves photographed with their lanterns. And so here we see Maliguele on the right together with his brother uh, in front of the lantern that he fabricated. The finale consisted of a series of pageants during, e during each of which a lantern was pushed across the Fedeb Square, preceded by the historical personage that had erected the building of which the lantern was a reproduction. The lantern was followed by the drummers and the women's choir. When the lantern had been shown to the public, a soundtrack was played that spoke to the historical accomplishments of the historical persona. After this, the women's choir sang a song of honor to the lantern's patron. Three different lanterns were just shown in three different historical scenes and their three different patrons were thus praised in song. The last fanal, or lantern, to be brought out represented the fortress of Podor, as you can see here, um, which is the town that Umusi hailed from. This fanal was preceded by Fedab, the American student, who had ordered the fortress to be built. Fedab, who was meant to stride across the square named after him, was actually very nervous and paralyzed. While he was to process arm in arm with his signare, he actually lost hold of her, and each of them walked across the square in different directions. Only after an intervention by an assistant were they united again. But the more serious point is that the lantern, in a way, embodies the patron, and that through the comparison made between the patron and the historical persona who built the historical um, house or fortress, the patron is aggrandized. It is implied that his achievements are perhaps comparable to those of the historical persona with whom he or she is compared. And in that sense, the presentation of the fanal or lantern to the patron is a form of celebration of the patron and perhaps even a revelation of his virtuous and, and uh, his virtuous persona and, and the achievements of his of his life. The Fanal as a festival is of course a spectacle of cultural mixing or what anthropologists call creolization. If the creolization of its cultural forms is spectacular, some forms can nevertheless be identified with a particular origin. The format of the pageant, Son et Lumière, is ostensibly derived from French revolutionary culture, while the praise singing can safely be attributed to Wolof ethnic culture. But no, not all aspects of the fanal can be attributed to a particular origin and creolization has effectively merged cultural origins in hybrid forms. For instance, the reproduction of the colonial architecture in lanterns 
that is the material focus of the finale, clearly um, amalgamates different origins because the lantern references, for instance, the ship's lantern of the ships that were part of the French maritime um, empire. They reference colonial architecture, um, the houses that were inhabited by the signares, um, and in a way their colorful exterior also seems to remember the taste for uh, opulent dress by the by the, signare, uh, by the signare women. So there are multiple references here that resonate in the in the uh, in the lantern that is that is fabricated and, and offered to the patient. There are other unexpected creolizations of form and meaning that suggest that the funnel is a creolization of self-fashioning. In fact, the praise singing, uh, which is which is uh, depicted here, has taken on a creolized form itself, amalgamating in one song the patron's genealogy and his curriculum vitae. Songs speak simultaneously to the professional career of the patron and his family genealogy, celebrating at once individual achievement and family honor. The eulogies creolize the values associated with personal advancement on the basis of merit, with values associated with an economy of honor based on ascription by birth. Thus, the creolized form of the praise song reflects the creolization of its subject and the finale as a festival, in a way, celebrates a form of creolized citizenship. In Saint Louis, this creolized subjectivity exists, exists to this day. Although most Métis families left Saint Louis at Senegal's independence to settle in metropolitan France, Saint Louis is still very much a creolized society today. And the proof, in a way, is in the finale itself. Now, the Lantern Festival originated with a class of Catholic Métis. It is today performed by African Muslims. Of course, creolization does not in the least imply the disappearance of cultural hierarchy. But one can clearly see how Wolof and French cultural forms have been creolized in order to celebrate the status of the elite. In the context of the festival, the distinction between signares and their domestic slaves is remembered in different forms of embodiment. There can be no doubt that the finale is crucial in establishing social distinction. I suggest that the finale enables the making of elite selves through the identification of the patron with his or her historical personage, enabled through the identification of the patron with his lantern. Let me explain. First, it should be emphasized that the production company selects the patrons from amongst established Saint Louis families. Second, the company chooses a historical building that will be represented as fanal, as lantern. The choice for the historical building is at least partly inspired by the relationship that the historical persona had with this building. Thus, amidst the cacophony of historical representations, very, pre very precise relationships are remembered between the patron, his or her lantern, and a historical persona. And this is, of course, to a large part due um, to the um, 
work of the craftsman. Here, we need to remember that craftsmen are often called upon to mediate. In the context of the fanal, they clearly mediate between past and present. Thus, praise singers recite the genealogies and curriculum vitae of the patron, and thereby establish the patron as an honorable member of his or her family. Invariably, the patrons express surprise at how well the songs convey their family and personal histories. Um, it might be possible that the exclamation of surprise at the contents of the song denotes the discovery of one's self. Indeed, when singers talk about the effects of their songs on, on the patrons, they invariably draw attention to the fact that the patron was surprised and that he or she was subsequently moved to tears. And I remember very well that one of uh, the people involved in the fanal told me that François Mitterrand, the French uh, president, once visited Saint-Louis and was presented a fanal, and that he too, when seeing the lantern, was moved to tears. Considering the secretive nature of the preparation of praise song and lantern, I would like to suggest that this culturally prescribed display of emotion may actually hint at what I can only term the revelation of oneself through song and lantern. Patron and public attend the fanal in order to learn about the patron who recognizes himself in the song and the lantern fabricated by the craftsman. Considering the capacity of craftsmen to mediate, it is within their means to actually materialize the patron's self in song and lantern and subsequently reveal this self as a virtu virtuous person to the public. Here you can see a lantern parked as it was after the performance in the neighborhood um, where the craftsman had fabricated the, uh, this lantern. As you can tell by looking closely, um, a child is watching the lantern and admiring it. By way of conclusion, I would like to state that in the fanal, the self of the patron is fashioned by craftsmen and recognized by the public present at the presentation of the lantern as a beacon of the nation. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, that you have a great uh, fair. Thank you very much.